232 miles of road, carrying over 40 million vehicles a year. The M6 is the longest and one of the busiest motorways in Britain. 24-7, 365, the M6 is solid every day of the year. Outside Birmingham, it meets four other motorways, and keeping them running is a constant battle for time and resources. There are 101 different jobs on this motorway, yet not one motorist is aware of what we do. A hidden army of men and women work day and night. Have you ever lay down on the M6? I have. And I've played football on the M25. <laughs> Whatever the weather. <laughs> on the M5, you'll find your money. On the M50, you'll find the port. Every day, they set out to control the chaos. Right there! Jeez. And to help us when things go wrong. 2-1, can I have an ambo, please? Trying at all costs <laughs> oh. to keep Britain on the move. Oh, God! Please! Ah! Oh, I think my tyre's blown! I should call it the Mad Six instead of the M6. <laughs> to the motorway. Mm -hmm. um, now, you've had some experience with dual carriageway sort yeah. of thing. But today, we're going to look at going into bigger motorways, more lanes. This, you will find, will be a little bit different, a little okay. bit more intense, all right? Mm. What should we talk about now? Oh, uh, I don't know. We could talk about how people drive, how bad they drive. Oh, the motorway. Oh, which way? Am I coming off? Am I staying, staying on, aren't I? Is that, that must be a yeah, junction, then. Yeah, it's yeah. Oh, I, do I can see better out of this moment. Do we need a signal, do you think? Do you reckon? I think so. No, which signal are we coming out, aren't we? That's a confusing one. We're nearly there, actually. Oh! Oh, what's that? What's that? Oh, that's just making me <laughs> jump. It made me jump. <laughs> <laughs> At the West Midlands Regional Control Centre, a team of Highways Agency traffic officers monitor an 84-mile stretch of the M6. I'm looking for an HGV, uh, a car transporter, which apparently has got a vehicle on the top of it that could potentially strike a bridge. During peak times, up to 8,000 vehicles an hour use this section of the motorway. And part of the job here is to spot problems before they happen. Hold on. I've got it. Six five, yeah. Five six one nine. Boots open on the Monday out the front, I think. What? Yeah, mate, just coming down. Bridges are a set height. There's the potential that that could actually strike the bridge. I'm just worry about it because if it does catch, one, it could possibly dislodge the vehicle. Just passing the mic slip, mate, from Corley it could rip off the actual boot of the car, and then that'll end in a carriageway, and that obviously will cause you the secondary incident as a result. Come on. Yes, it is lane one, mate. Hold on. Right, just keep going, keep going. Yeah, mate, I'm just watching it on two, see if it comes off at two. Yeah, indeed, he's off at two, off at two. He's actually pulled over, mate. Someone's brought something to his attention. He has stopped, mate. Many years ago when I was here at the same location, brand new Range Rover, I think it was a Range Rover Sport, fell right off the back of an actual HGV car transporter and careered across the carriageway and luckily didn't hurt anyone. But yeah, went onto the hard shoulder. Every year in Britain, there are more than 250,000 road traffic collisions, known as RTCs. We see a lot of bad driving. Um, driver behaviour, I think, causes a lot of the problem. That's why we call them road traffic collisions rather than accident, because there's always someone to blame. It used to be the old RTA, now it's the RTC, because there's always someone at fault. If you crash a car, it could be weather related, it could be driver error, it could be car error. There's always something called someone to blame. No such things as accidents. 
as well as attempting to prevent and respond to road traffic collisions. The Highways Agency constantly looks to improve sections of the motorway where RTCs happen more often. They're clearing the debris before they let the traffic go. We always get the blame for closing lanes, and it's not us that closes the lanes, it's the people who cause the accidents. <laughs> Their current focus is on Capthorpe Junction at the start of the M6, a busy interchange linking the motorway to the M1 and A14 trunk road. It's our black spot area. We tend to find that, especially on the approach towards the M1, that's where we have quite a few incidents, purely because of the layout of the road. At its centre is an unusual and outdated road layout, called the dumbbells or teardrops, that's about to be redesigned. Two roundabouts, and this is the link that gets you from the M6 to the A14, is this stretch of road here. The dumbbells here, there's two. There's an eastern one and a western one. This is the western one. Um, they're actually going to get rid of that altogether. So there'll be two through roads, which will then prevent all of the congestion of all of the heavy goods vehicles trying to get under this bridge um, and around both of the teardrops. The cost of redesigning the junction is just over 190 million pounds. A private contractor will be overseeing and carrying out the works. If we're not deducting it, could they put a pole on this side and string it across, and then we can go down once we get into the highway boundary? In charge of the project is construction manager Mark Sutton. The junction needs improving. You've got vast amounts of queuing traffic. Obviously, there's an increased risk of accidents, and unfortunately, the Catford interchange is, 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 is known for its severe accidents that, happened over, that have occurred over the last decade. The design to replace the old dumbbell system will take two years to complete and involve building six new bridges, four new slip roads and a local link road on 78 acres of newly acquired farmland. I've just got a call from our general foreman out on site and he's released the balls into the field. He's, he's scattered feed all around very close to our works boundary. I don't know how to deal with it. I must have been sick the day we did this at uni because so all, they want, all, all I want to do is put a fence up. I started working with Skanska just over 10 years ago. I love the engineering and I love these big massive infrastructure jobs and the challenge they pose. Everyone else can sit in an office and maybe they get a report produced at the end of the day. We can actually go out on the ground and you get to see the bridges, the roads, the highways. And they're there for the lifetime. Whenever a civil engineer drives down and he's got company in the car, they're always bragging about what they've built and showing off the structures that they've done. But for the local community around Catthorpe, the construction of a safer and less congested junction is a mixed blessing. Is that the slip road there as well? The well, slip road will come, yeah. start yeah. from the far end. Michael and Susan Grindle have owned their farm next to the junction for the last 40 years. All these trees are going to come down, they've got to come down, so what's going to happen is they're going to get more noise and more light. I just think it's an awful shame when they take this land for these roads, which we'll never get back. You know, we're supposed to be a green and pleasant land and we're just getting built upon. Is it necessary, really? Every day, Michael Grindle and his sons have to negotiate motorway traffic to get to their fields. Now they'll have to contend with months of roadworks as the junction is redesigned. It's a very strange junction. You've got motorway traffic and lo local traffic intermingling, which is never a good thing, really. We're both sides of the junction, really, and we've even got a field right in the middle of the junction, which we call the triangle field, because it's a triangle for obvious reasons. You know, we've always had to use that junction. We've lived with that junction. I mean, it's, it's going to be a headache because we won't be able to get to it that way. So we don't know yet. We've in talks with the highways agency and Skanks about what they can provide for us so that we can get to that land. It's going to make it, to be polite, a pain. It's not just the local humans who could be affected by the roadworks. Otters. Otters. We are supposed to be fitting an otter ledge to the A14 bridge. That one? Yeah. Hedgehogs, there is no Skanska requirement, but it specifically says we need to produce a poster for hedgehogs. Just 
Can they read? Yes. <laughs> Very clever hedgehogs in this area. Keep out. Yeah, don't come this way. Uh, amphibians. Yeah. So the first oh, no. one. Newts. Leave that area clear until after the newts have been uh, yep, relocated. Yeah. Okay, so newts. Okay, I'm happy with them. Okay. Out on the ground, environmental coordinator Richard Waddell works with both the ecologists and the Skanska engineers. We leave that maple in and we'll just from the maple up. The issue we've got here is Skanska want to get rid of this hedgerow and all this vegetation here before the birds start to nest. It's pretty warm at the moment and normally the birds will start nesting from March, but there's a risk they'll start nesting now because it is getting quite warm. But the newts are likely to be hibernating in the hedgerows, the base of the hedgerows here. So they've gone into all the other areas of site with large machines to get rid of these, this vegetation. But here they're going to have to come in with uh, chainsaws, pull it out by hand, make sure they don't trample on any newts. And then once your guys get in there in the thick of it, if you can make sure that you're keeping the, uh, the remaining stumps a minimum of 150 mil, yeah, six inches above the ground. They're a protected species. Uh, they're a European protected species. We've got a good population of newts in this country. They're still on the decline, but because of that, we have to protect our population of great crested newts. For now, the base of the hedgerows in this section will remain until the newts awake from hibernation and are then transferred to their breeding ponds. I've never seen a newt. I've never seen a great crested newt. And I've definitely not picked one up. You need to be licensed to pick one up. The number of lorries seems to me to have grown so much. It drives me crazy. Be careful of your position, you seem to getting a little bit scared of these lorries or something, are you? A little bit. There's enough room for you all. Oh, this I don't like. I feel sandwiched and there's three, one arm to the other. So you've got nowhere to go. And this is why I don't like motorway driving. The majority of people on a motorway will say, if everybody drives sensibly and correctly, then we'd all get on fine. Out on the road, the Central Motorway Police Group target drivers falling foul of the law as part of their mission to make the motorway safer. Got a seatbelt on? Good lad. Today, Sergeant Rob Lever and PC Dave Gaunt are patrolling a section of the M6 in an unmarked lorry. Yeah, it's a red seat belt hung down by the side. It refuses to look at me. Height for us is, is a really big advantage because obviously from, from a car perspective, looking up to a lorry, it, it's very difficult to be able to get a clear view. This gives you the advantage that you can really look down into the cars as well and catch some of those people out. But I've got a transit van to my near side now that's on the phone. Looks like he's got a whitish sort of Samsung up to his right ear. switched the phone across to his other ear and he's just put it down. <laughs> We've got a um, vehicle that we're following at the moment, which Dave has detected that the door is not wearing his seatbelt. So one of our patrols is just waiting on the hard shoulder here. He's going to uh, pull this vehicle over and deal with him for the seatbelt offence. Right, he still so hasn't got it on now. Um, my colleagues who are stopping the vehicles that we're seeing, they're, they're, they're referring people for education courses. And when these drivers go on the courses, they will see what we see. It really does work. It really does prevent people from uh, continuing to drive using their phones or not wear the seatbelt. So it's, it's, it's a valuable lesson um, and one best learnt in a classroom and not for real. Hello, put your seatbelt on. Put your seatbelt on. Just drop back a fraction. Put your seatbelt on.
25 miles away at junction 6, Inspector Mark Watkins is heading to a road traffic collision. So knowing what you're going to be dealing with within the next sort of half an hour or so. Things change very, very quickly, almost like the weather. What we know is that traffic on the northbound carriageway slowed down. The lorry at the front, that's been hit by the blue lorry, which has hit the taxi, and the other lorry at the back has then got into the back of the, the blue lorry. Amazingly, the driver of the blue lorry, his cab has actually come off as part of the collision and has landed in the carriageway. You can see, it's fairly obvious, the white bit should be on the bit with the engine. You would expect there to be really quite serious injuries as a result of this, and amazingly, uh, everybody has walked away from this. But it's brought the M6 motorway to a complete and utter closure. Absolutely, it's been carnage. It's the only way to describe it is carnage. Yeah. It's got traffic queuing in all directions, and we've got six lanes of queuing traffic on the A38M. All the traffic that was travelling northbound on the M6 automatically gets diverted towards Birmingham city centre. So we're pushing more traffic in, there's more traffic trying to come out. It just grinds to a halt eventually. Lane three, please. Look that way! Because they've been stuck for so long, they obviously want to know what's been causing it. But what you're starting to see is they're going slowly, starting to speed up, but trying to look at what's happening behind them at the same time. And worryingly, they're starting to veer towards me a little bit. Slow down! Slow down! It doesn't sound very nice, does it, rubber necking? But uh, it's exactly what it is. People are, are stretching their neck, looking over the shoulders, trying to see what's going on. See people driving their cars on the other side of the carriageway, filming with their mobile phones as they're driving past. As long as I'm getting the quick upload to Twitter or Facebook, I mean, they're happy. And that's all you can think about. Looking at somebody else's misery. Taking pictures on your phone, you're still using your mobile phone, mate. £100 fine and three points. Get on your way. Hello, Neil. Recovery teams take away the damaged lorries, but the carriageway can't be reopened until the motorway has been inspected. The lanes three and four might be quite badly damaged. We might just have to close lanes three and four and only open two lanes, but it's still better than none. So we'll see where it goes. <laughs> it's just a waiting game for us now. Noel Phillips is the incident duty officer. He's concerned that the fluid from the crash has leaked onto the carriageway. Just small old diesel. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just going to have to carry on treating it, see if we can get it, get it, get it up and get it absorbed up. If not, it's going to have to be uh, trying to do something about resurfacing, but that's the last option. Diesel's really, really, of course, it's a big problem. Um, if it does get to that stage and it seeps in too deep and we can't get it off the carriageway, you have to resurface it. The diesel and the oil now started going into the tarmac. Uh, as soon as you get any rain on that, it's just going to come straight back out again and, and we're going to end up with accidents. The signs aren't good at the moment, are It's going to be a resurfacing job. Total closure for a while then? Yes, it's going to be a long night then. Oh dear. The inspector's just inspected the carriageway and it's worse than worst case scenario because we thought it'd only be two lanes. Unfortunately, all four lanes need to be resurfaced. We have to keep the carriageway shut until I'm certain that the travelling public can travel on the network in the same condition previous to the incident. If I neglected to do my job, then the next incident that happened or accident that happened would be due to my neglect, and that's, that's, not, that's not what we're here for. It probably opened as a managed motorway two weeks ago, so it's still fairly new. <laughs> And you're already digging and it up. And we're already digging it up, yeah. There's, there's going to be a fair bit of work. In the end, it took a team of road workers six hours and 40 minutes to resurface the carriageway. The bill for the work is estimated at over £40,000 and will be paid for by the insurers of the vehicles involved. 
obviously this can't go onto the tax base. This has to be sought after, uh, and um, a payment has to be ta taken from the uh, the people that caused the incident, and it's not the not the tax base. The cost of redesigning Catthorpe Junction at the start of the M6 is just over £190 million of taxpayers' money. It's just nice, after all these years, to suddenly be out here. We've got pegs out, we've got the fence lines coming up, we've got the trees coming down, we've got the speed cameras going up. We're going to get a good start on this jump, it's going to be fantastic. After 11 years of planning, the first stage of the roadworks has begun. Like vampires, are we? Night walkers. As the motorways can't be closed during the redesign work, the first step is to give the construction workers safe areas in which to operate. Oh, Jesus. We'll have narrower lanes than usual be in place, so you need to drop the speed down so people are driving safely through. The barriers are there designed to be impacted at a certain speed, and we have that all designed to ensure that the people that are going to be working here on the verges, putting the new duck runs in, putting the new bridges in, are kept safe. It's going to cause a bit like <laughs> taking uh, three lanes down to two lanes for the M1 and the M6, but, you know, it's got to be done. That's the thing that the public can't seem to get their head around. They want the roads repairing, they want them maintained, but they don't want anybody to come out and do it. So what are you supposed to do? That's why everything's done at night, because it's, you know, it's, it's a lot quieter. Damien West and his team yeah. will be marking yeah, out the new right. temporary lanes. This is a lining machine, plastic lining machine. Does all variant types, white, black, spray, extrusion, rib line. Let's keep pull forward, Shag, so we can set up. To paint the new white lines over miles of motorway, a high-powered dryer prepares the road before paint is sprayed on to the carriageway. Pretty ferocious, like they're about 135 decibel. Until Catthorpe Junction is finished, there will be night works on and off for the next 24 months. Do you know why this junction's being re redesigned and stuff? Yeah. Can you tell me why? It's shit. Yeah, it's been needing doing for a long time. Just a mile from the roadworks is the rural village of Swinford. Today, construction manager Mark Sutton and his team are holding a public exhibition here to unveil their new plans for Catthorpe Junction. I've got great faith that uh, everyone's going to be nice and polite and that we're going to have all the answers ready for people. Last minute revision. <laughs> rural stress. <laughs> I think I might just give them a quick call. <laughs> Ivan Marriott works for the Highways Agency and will be helping construction manager Mark answer queries from the locals. So that junction is going to change completely. Yeah. What we're building there is the mirror image of the existing off-slip. See, I lived at Catthorpe until I got married. So I've seen a lot of changes, and that was 42 years ago. 43. 43, all right. Every time we come through, there's bumpers and <laughs> wheel trims and you know, somebody smacks somebody, you know. It should never have been done as it was, but obviously people didn't foresee the amount of traffic. This is good, this is all for the best. It's all for good, yeah. I mean, one I've taught myself is not to open the mouth unless you know what you're going to respond to. <laughs> There's no room for blagging anything here. You've got to be completely truthful, completely honest. If you don't know, and if I don't know, say so, make the note, get the details and come back with the detail later today. How, who can I contact during the night? During the night? Yes. You can contact, do you want my details? Who are you work for? I'm Scanscan. No, I certainly don't, okay. not under any conditions. With night works already underway, the construction has become all too real for local farmer Mr Turney. I haven't had any sleep for three nights. I've got eight, seven or eight vehicles grinding, flashing lights and banging all night in front of the house. I object to being woken up. Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, how are you supposed to work when you can't get a night's sleep? We have to 
There's some elements of the work we have got to do at night time because we can't do them during Why the day. not? Well, we've got to do the work at night time because that's the only time we can get on the network and do this particular activity, which is but it's just very dangerous and therefore the only time we can... Well, how do dangerous do you think it is if we drive tractors and deal with stock and we've had no sleep all night? The, that's safe, is it? You shouldn't be allowed to wake people at night, people who are entitled to a night's sleep. I don't particularly want to disturb your sleep, Mr Taylor, and that's not what we're trying to do. We'll look at to see whether there's anything else we can do and I'll come back to you on that one. Very good. Okay. Mm. No, I look that. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> It is like being a little bit on sort of question time, I suppose, isn't it? You don't know what people are going to throw at you. But I do understand that in certain circumstances, if somebody's either been kept awake at night or whatever, then they're going to be agitated for, for reasons. And I know I've got to deal with that as part of, as part of the role that we, we do here. So it's not over yet. <laughs> <laughs> One regular user of Catthorpe Junction is trucker Paul Reed. He will also be attending the exhibition. And it's notorious. I mean, I don't think there's anybody in the country that doesn't know about the junction. I don't believe that what's being put forward is sufficient enough to improve the whole junction itself. He's dedicated hours of his spare time designing his own vision of the junction. I was watching the film The Great Escape and uh, many years ago, and uh, I thought that's where the idea came from. The, the idea was that it said, well, if we can build tunnels as good as what we can, why can't we do the same here? I always believe that the British are best for engineering anything. It consists of two underpasses. It has additional levelling roads, which come from the M1 northbound, from the M6, and it also has from the A14 going up to M1 southbound in the far corner. Now it's time to see how Paul's plans measure up against Mark's. Mm, okay. Hello there. Hello. Mr. Reed. I've got a couple of questions. Yep, quick look on. on yeah. Door. There's a hell of a lot of lorries that use this junction. This is the this is the bugbear because lorries aren't fast, they're slow. They need plenty of room to merge together. When you've got cars dittering around in here, out there, it's it's like a pinball game. And unfortunately, that's why accidents happen. With the construction of the uh, the contraflow and the, the, the sort of taper that we'll form, I think mean, that will be the that will actually physically prevent people from doing that. Uh, I've looked at this and I've looked obviously at mine and, and as far as I'm concerned, you know, the concept is exactly the same. It's just that mine's tunnels and yours is a, is a, is a, is a dual carriageway which goes under the M1. But as it stands, looking at this, yes, it'll work. I hope so. That's the main thing is get rid of that congestion on that M6 and then put it off again. That's the main driver. The M6 is a major transport route, with lorries carrying up to 182 million tonnes of goods to the northwest of the country every year. This will do for me. Golf November Zulu. The trailer looks like it's worth doing. Keeping watch over them at a strategic check site near Junction 14 is a team of inspectors from the Department for Transport. Keep moving. This tire's about to blow at any time. It'll go bang. 385, 65, 22.5, super singles, these are known as. If this goes bang, chances are it could rip off the back tyre and all sorts of things. He won't be leaving here with this tyre on, that's for sure. He'll get a fixed penalty for it. Change. Change. The inspectors here target lorries they suspect are faulty or unsafe and have the power to pull over any lorry driving on British roads. One of the supporting straps is broken. And the trouble is that the other strap and the supporting structure is that weak. That's just not going to last much longer. But if it fell out, it's bouncing down the road, and that's going to cause a massive obstruction and possibly cause fatalities. It's more than likely the trailer will be immobilised if it's not repaired by 5 o'clock. We get treated like scum by everybody, by other car drivers, by the police, but yet every single thing that's in every shop and everybody's house has been in the back of a lorry at some point in time. And there'd be no next day delivery or no fresh bread if it wasn't for us, so 
you know, they should be grateful that we pound the highways night and day. But lorry drivers have limitations on the amount of hours they can pound the highways. Can I just ask you to jump out so I can take your taco? Tachographs record their every movement and will reveal whether a driver has gone over their maximum nine hours regulated driving time. Clearly we see offences at the side of the road every single day, whether that's a deliberate attempt to flout the rules and regulations or whether it's a genuine lack of knowledge. It's debatable, isn't it, really? But a minority of lorry drivers flout the rules more deliberately. The use of simple magnets can disable the tachograph, allowing them to drive longer undetected. We've got the, the magnet that was actually found here and uh, it's a particularly strong magnet and we've got some photos of the evidence here as well so that is currently going through due process at the moment the the information we received for the roadside was that in fact there were 307 kilometers missing from the tachograph down to that magnet being utilized uh, and in fact the driver had been on duty for for over 19 hours when he was stopped as well as disabling the tachograph they also interfere with the anti-lock braking systems and the speed limiters on the on the vehicle, so yeah. you've got a nasty cocktail there. This is a company from Netherlands. We can see there that we're entering in the southeast ports. Uh, they're travelling uh, northwest through the Midlands up on the M6. From April the 5th, uh, they become a national target for impounding. So what we can expect over the next couple of weeks, if we're successful in targeting, in one or two of these vehicles being impounded. That's right. Good. In the last year, 38 magnets have been found at this check site on the M6. So, uh, this is the cupboard of shame, basically. Yes. <laughs> Everything up here is magnets. Absolutely right. full. What happens is the, the magnet kills the electronic signal, and um, then the tachograph just thinks it's at rest. The companies quote for the work, and they give them these unrealistic Timescale. timescales yeah. to get yeah. there, and the drivers are under pressure to do it, and the boss says, well, I don't care how you do it, you just get there on mm. that. If you've got to be there at eight in the morning, you've got to be there. If you've got to drive through the night, I don't care how you do it, and that's what they do. The risking their own lives and as well. Road users. So they're driving a 40-ton missile, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they can be extremely, you know, cause carnage <laughs> and death, and this is what the problem is. <laughs> Look at this big lorry, Sebby. What do you think's inside that big lorry, Sebby? What do you think it's carrying inside? I think there's monsters in there. Yeah. Monsters? Yes. Monsters? Monsters on the motorway? Ah! Huh. I missed it! So is this still a motorway? This is a motorway at the moment, yes. Is it? Some of this, if you if you want, have a drink. Remember, you need to tell me if you need to stop for a wee wee again, Sebby. I know, but that's James's milk. But you can have Where's some Sebby's? if you want. I don't know. So, oh, he's just throwing it on the floor, Sebastian. I can't reach that now. Every year, millions of lorries travel up and down the M6, carrying everything from petrol to sewage, from beer to live animals. How long do we think? We've said it could take up to three hours to repair the barriers. Mm -hmm. Outside Stoke-on-Trent on the M6, a lorry carrying a cargo of bread, vegetables and milk has overturned and spilt its load. Quickly found it on camera and realised there was quite a lot of fluid coming out of it, which was later discovered to be milk. Although it's only milk, it, it can be quite a serious issue. What caused the accident is unclear, but luckily, the driver escaped with minor injuries. Now, the highways agency must close the whole southbound carriageway as they attempt to clear the scene. We've stopped the traffic, ready to install a nice big line of cones across there. Yeah, they're travelling through now to, to meet us at Yarnfield and just making sure everyone's aware of what I'm doing. Motorway maintenance manager Paul Diamond needs to get to the scene as quickly as possible. Cheers, thank you. Just been given the okay now to travel northbound on the southbound carriageway, which is under a total closure, so it's safe to do so. Which will uh, assist us in getting to scene. 
Paul's job is to oversee the vital repairs and assess the cost of the damage. That's a rare sight. It's a car travelling the wrong way down the motorway. And that's one way of missing the queues. He'll be a senior road worker. A lot of the milk, you probably can just see it's come off the truck. It's gone into the drains and going under here, down the water course, the uh, environmental agency have been, and they're worried, and they have a team down there at the moment trying to stop it getting into a pond and contaminating the pond, because milk is worse than most stuff, because it just takes all the oxygen out of the water and kills fish. There's a big issue when it gets into the water, a very costly issue as well. So will a fish have a cost? Yeah, um, carp can be worth up to a £1,000 a fish for a big fish. So it all depends now on how much of the milk's got into the water course. Has the diesel and the milk got through to the pond or the roof? It has. It has, yeah. People don't realise that something happening here can affect something a kilometre away from the motorway. And it's the environment and, of course, the environment, no one wants to damage the environment in any shape or form. But the motorway must run. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the position I'd expect them to be in now to start lifting the vehicle, so hopefully it shouldn't take too long. The last one I did down here was loaded with salmon to have done the same thing. And all we were doing is carting salmon for hours. Four or five hours into the job of mauling salmon about you, smell a little bit, you know. Oh, the cab slipped. I'm going to get something under the wheels to make it grip. Yeah. The recovery having a bit of trouble at the moment, uh, getting this vehicle up, it's uh, slipping on the milk and diesel. At the moment, we're in the hands of the recovery firm, so as soon as they're out of the way, we'll start repairing the centre reserve. The lads can work here, so we're getting this one done now. As long as the recovery's here, we're, we're sort of depressurised slightly, but as soon as they're gone, that's when the pressure is piled onto us to get out of the way. It's a very long junction, 14 to 15. Our priority is informing the public. If you don't have to go on this motorway, don't. But you can see how many people are involved on the scene at the moment. I mean, it's a huge recovery operation. Yeah, it's that watch now, watch now. Here we go, here we go. See what's happened as it's been lifted up. The side has completely come off it, which has made our job even worse. This has added hours to the recovery. HCV's been writing by the looks of it. They write it that the side split and the rest of the contents have fallen out into the carriageway. Oh, God. So nice. there's more bread and milk on the carriageway now. <laughs> this is uh, Keel Services and it's absolutely gridlocked, and we have 60 minutes of delays on the southbound. We have 11 kilometres of congestion, all filtering into a single lane of traffic. It, it, it is a huge problem, and the traffic will only get busier. Now, these guys, they've had all of the local travel alerts. Every junction, we've, we've warned them about these delays. I'll show you the end of the queue. Oh, you may need a tank to get through the traffic for the next two hours. <laughs> Along its 232 miles, the M6 carves through some of Britain's most beautiful rural landscapes. In the redesign to make Catthorpe Junction at the start of the M6 less congested and safer, 78 acres of farmland have been acquired. Every project has some ecological species that's causing problems for a contractor. Uh, with this one, it's the great crested newt. To protect the colony of newts in this section of the proposed roadworks, one and a half miles of special fencing is being erected across farmland. The biggest issue is this is a protected species and all here are liable for prosecution if great crested newts are found to be uh, killed by these works. Along the fence, 
buckets are dug into the ground to catch the endangered newts. The newts go to the newt fencing, they'll hit the fence, and then the aim is that they'll walk along the fence and, and fall in the bucket. And it's project ecologist Nick Steggles' job to check them every day. We've got some vegetation in here so that they can actually hide under from, from any predators that, that might be about at night. We, we've got what we call a, a mammal ladder, which is a, effectively a, a stick which we, we place in the trap so that if any small mammals uh, fall in there, they can actually climb out and, and free themselves. We also have a, a float so that if we get a heavy deluge through the night, so they don't drown, and then we'll, we'll release them the next morning. You, you never know what you're going to find. Hopefully great crested newts. We're going to trap for 60 days in this area, uh, but come the end of that trapping period, we need five clear days without newts. Uh, or without a newt find. So if we find a newt on day 59, Skanska will have to trap until day 64. And if we find another newt on day 63, it will go on and on and on. <laughs> it was a project further north. They took account of the cost of the fencing, exclusion, uh, some of the mitigation measures for newts, and they estimated it was about 37,000 pound per newt on that job. Yeah, most of this uh, truck is now strapped up. We're just uh, putting the last of the load in. I'm just giving them a hand uh, to try and speed things up a bit over. On the M6, the lorry carrying the cargo of milk, bread and vegetables has now been righted. Neat carrots, parsnips, turnips. I've seen it all now. I'm sure there's somebody who can play them. There's no milk and vegetables at the store. But the clear-up has meant that the southbound carriageway has been closed for four hours, causing even bigger delays. I've already noted down a lot of vehicles that have actually already pulled over onto the hard shoulder. So you get cars overheating, you get HGVs pulling over for brakes because they know that they've been stuck for so long. This is the start of our region. All we can do is keep pushing to get this vehicle cleared as quickly as possible. Every little helps. Hey, Derek, you're right. Motorway maintenance manager Paul Diamond is responsible for clearing the scene and fixing the damaged barriers as soon as possible. Hello, we're going to need two to man that gate and then three on the barrier. Oops. Starts off with the public. They get stuck in traffic, they ring the Highways Agency information line, start complaining. That then gets relayed to the Highways Agency control room. They relate to our control room and our control room relate to us. And then it's ETAs, ETAs, ETAs all the time. What time are you going to be done? Looking, looking at what we've got, and if we get the blokes in quick enough, I think we should have it boxed off by 9 o'clock. That's if they go in the next half an hour, three quarters an hour with this trailer. But the only bad news is, the liquid that was in the trailer, the milk, etc., has got into the drains and it's got into the golf course and now it's got through into their lake. And they're trying to do as much as they can to, uh, to lessen the damage that's caused. She hasn't come back yet, so I don't know if it's killing fish or anything as yet. Looking at it now, we're, uh, we're getting somewhere now. So as soon as the recovery's out of the way, we'll start to clean up and then we'll repair everything. Are you ready to go? You're just trusting that your team manager on scene is having the right amount of contact and putting the right amount of pressure on them. Where are we at? Uh, further than what we were last time. <laughs> Give a rough estimate of time. Another hour. Another hour? Yeah. OK. What's the right amount of pressure? A lot. <laughs> ETI is getting late, so it's approximately one hour. It's my job to make sure that these guys feel the pressure, just to make sure that everything moves as quickly as it can. It's all go. Busy, busy, busy. I mean, I've done hazardous spillages before. They're the worst, actually. There was one with the conditioner, Lenore, that spilt across it all and sweeping it actually activated it, so it made it worse before it got better. It smelt nice, soft. <laughs> this 
Council incident that will go to the ministers. They'll want to know why it's taken so long to uh, get the carriageway reopened because obviously it has a massive impact, not just on the travelling public, but also on the uh, finances of the nation. Well, we're all just carry on getting wet because we love it. Further down the M6, traffic officers Keith and JJ are on patrol. You could be the best driver in the world and you're, you're adhering to the road, you're adhering to but some other fool that ain't going to take any notice and wipe you out. A van has broken down in the hard shoulder, but as it's rush hour, the smart motorway scheme is operating and the lane is open to traffic. Our crew's just arrived on scene, um, recovery's arrived on scene at the same time as we've got there, so hopefully one or the other will move the vehicle out so we can get the traffic flowing again. It's only going to be about seven or eight minutes. We've uh, put a few cones out and some signs out just to make sure that it's a safer working environment for him, basically. Are those cones really going to make a difference, those little cones? Uh, I'm hoping it does. It really puts the heebie-jeebies on me, to be fair, because we are so reliant on drivers paying attention. If we have a lapse in concentration, they could kill us. <laughs> you don't know, dude? Yeah, I'll get the cones in now, then. See? There you go. That car. <laughs> Taking our notice. Absolutely ridiculous. Can't really legislate or, or uh, put procedures in place for idiots. I'm sorry, but you can't. Why, why, why are we running? There may be another idiot using this lane. <laughs> That's why I want to get out of here and go to the next stop alive. <laughs> so call it the Mad Six instead of the M6. <laughs> in the last five years, eight road workers have been killed and 135 injured whilst working on England's motorways. It's crazy. And many more have had near misses. Uh, I want to show you guys lane one closure for a, a tyre change and a HGV. I was getting my hat out the back of the car because it was raining, so I, I opened the door to get my hat out, and all, all of a sudden I heard people shout, watch out. I've looked up, this HGV is just coming straight towards the car. It's as if everything was happening in slow motion. And I thought I had more time to move out than I actually did, but oh so everything, yeah, signals set here. Yeah, look, yeah. look at that. Oh my God. One, Ooh. two. Oh, dude. Oh, shit. That's, that's close. Oh, that is. HGV going at that speed. Do you know what I mean? Don't show my wife that. I know. I, 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 to be fair, no. to this day, I haven't told my, my wife about it either. No. Have you t um, yeah, I haven't yeah. told her about it because she, no. she, she just, I don't know what she'd do. She probably said, that's it, quit, get another job. 40 ton weapon. I put my uniform on, going to work, and I might not be coming back. We've already talked about it, me and my partner, and I've prepared everything for the potential of me not coming back. Everything's in one place, life insurance, um, funeral stuff, uh, all the pensions, uh, work stuff, um, all the documents, at least that if, if she ever needs it or if anything happens to me, she knows what to do. I want to be cremated, so don't want to be a burden on anybody. <laughs> and be scattered on the M6. <laughs> 40 miles back up the M6, the motorway maintenance team have finally cleared the overturned grocery lorry and repaired the damaged barriers. We're reopening the carriageway now. Hooray! Let me cup of tea. <laughs> as soon as they see that first cone getting lifted up, everybody will stop and they'll wait for the next cone and if there's a gap, you'll see them and they're gone <laughs> every time. Are you chucking to the middle, Chris? <laughs> so I'd say by the time the fourth cone comes up, they'll be off. You ready? Here's your first cone. 
see who goes up first. But someone will make that move. There you go. They're off. As soon as the fourth cone was off, they're off. That's it. It's open now and they're away. That's dangerous. They don't have any concern for any of these guys on the road. They're just people that put down cones, and they hate cones. HGV's coming that close to you, you know, it's not a safe place. You've got to watch out for each other. It's dark, it's wet, it's fast. The slightest wrong turn for somebody in a vehicle can swerve. If you're not watching, your mate's watching, he's going to shout at you, you're going to jump one way or the other, possibly save your life. Very nice sight, seeing the cones come off. There you go, all clear. They'll be relieved to get through and on their way. It's cost businesses and, you know, industry a fortune. It was a big job, massive, for spilt milk. But you don't cry over it, though, but, but it's been... It's been, uh, yeah, a very, very long, long closure for us. At Catthorpe Junction at the start of the M6, groundworks on the redesign to make the interchange safer and less congested are underway. But on a section improving one of the local roads, the newts and other wildlife are still causing concern. Trying to pollard these trees to allow the works to go ahead. But the issue we've got now is we've got some of the trees have got birds nesting in them and some haven't and some of the trees that haven't got birds nesting in them have got birds in the tree next to it, so the ecologists are a little bit twitchy. There was a blackbird had nested uh, down the road there, and that caused a bit of a constraint, but some magpies came past and ate the eggs, and the, the, the blackbird is now gone, and so that constraint has been removed, so it changes on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a nest in there somewhere. Okay. Has that one been identified previously? No. So now we've got blue tits nesting in this tree that we didn't know about until Nick just told us. <laughs> Things change pretty quickly. You have a little move of the grass, turn over the float, make sure there's nothing in there. But there's one creature everyone's desperate to see. Every day, project ecologist Nick Stegel checks the traps for newts that have woken from hibernation. Found a, a great crested newt. She found a, a little female. If I turn her over ever so slightly, she's got a bright orange underside there. And she's got spots underneath. And each one of them's like a fingerprint. It's unique to that individual. A lot bigger than what I expected. Quite beautiful as well, aren't they? A like mini dinosaurs. Yeah. A little crocodile. She was on our site, and so she's been commuting over to the pond over there to breed and, and lay her eggs. Expensive newt. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that makes five. The cost is coming down. Yeah. Absolutely. Once caught, the newts are relocated away from the roadworks to the safety of the nearby farmland. So there she goes on her way. You can see how close she is to the breeding pond. So. Uh, Hopefully make it there tonight. The trapping will go on until there's no sign of newts, and they've all been removed from the site of the proposed roadworks. Great crested newts, particularly the males, they're like street boy, wide boy, marching across the landscape. <laughs> they spend tens of thousands of pounds a year to protect the newts. Strange, really. When I grew up, we used to go collecting newts as, as kids. We used to come back with buckets of them all the time, and all of a sudden, they're all protected. It's been quite a, a journey to get to where we are today, but it's not just we want to build a road, we go out and build a road. There's a huge amount of time, effort, and work, and passion to improve the safety of the network. The job's not easy, but then 
whose job ever is easy? If you ever ask anyone if their job's easy? I don't think I'd enjoy it if it was easy. It'd be dull. And at the end of this job, when you do drive along and you drive along the completed road and you see the structures that you've built, you see the road that you've built and you see the difference it makes, yeah, you do take a huge sense of pride out of it. I guess it's just a strip of tarmac <laughs> that, uh, that we all share. That's, that's one common goal we all have, that we're travelling in the same direction on the same piece of tarmac. It's all about... It's like choreographing. Well, you do dance, don't you? I do. You know all about choreography. It's I about know, choreography. It's about like dancing with traffic. Oh, no, 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 come on, go down 50 quick. You've only got to take your eyes off the road for just one split second, and the traffic's at a standstill, and you're going straight into the back of somebody else, and... It's easy done. Let's all kind of move along as a hippie commune and, and, and get to where we need to get to. We're all in a hurry. Everybody wants to get to where they want to be, but we all want to get there in one piece. I haven't been on this road for at least 10 years. <laughs> Junction 17. This is the stretch of road where my husband lost his life. He just got onto the motorway. He was in the centre lane doing 60 miles an hour. And a long distance lorry driver crashed into the back of a mobile crane on the northbound carriageway on the inside lane, which sent that crane across three lanes of traffic. It hit the central reservation, flew up into the air, went over the outside lane and crashed straight into the roof of my husband's car and then carried on and crashed into another lorry on the inside lane of the southbound carriageway. Three people died in the crash and the lorry driver was sentenced to five years in prison for causing death whilst driving. It was said in court that the driver had been on the road for 21 hours out of 29. I hate the word accident. I've never hated a word so much. My boys were just three and four months old. and my daughter was 14 months. And they don't know him. And they won't ever know him. I'd like people to understand that being responsible isn't a trivial thing. Obeying the rules of the road, doing what you're supposed to do, is necessary. That's all I want, is just everybody to just take a minute to just think about what you're doing. <laughs>